The Albuquerque Journal has once again enlisted Brian Sanderoff's research and polling company to survey important campaigns and issues ahead of the election. We don't see as much polling as we used to, and while we don't want to rely too much on them as a predictive tool, they give us a good idea of what's happening at a given moment and how strategies have been working throughout campaigns. Joining me in the studio through the magic of the internet is a welcome guest we're always glad to have, Catherine McGill. She's the founder and director of the New Mexico Black Leadership Council. Also joining me on the screen is former House Rep and line regular Dan Foley. And to complete our panel, we've got State Senator and line regular Dee Dee Feldman. All right, the president trails Joe Biden by 15 points, 50 to 39 percent. And maybe the big takeaway is Mr. Sanderoff and reporter Dan Boyd peeled that onion is that while the president's base is strong, moderates break hugely for Mr. Biden, about two to one. And Dan, I got to ask you, does the president's strategy here need to change if he wants to win New Mexico? And if, if, if he does have to change, how? I think it's hard to answer that question just because mm-hmm. you know, the polls have shown that it, they don't make any sense, right? I mean, you look at the gap between Biden and and uh, Trump in New Mexico, and then you look at how close the race is between Lujan and Ronchetti. Um, it's just it's just an interesting. I mean, and the sim and and the the reason I bring that up is Ronchetti's mm-hmm. made no bones about tying himself to the Trump train, and Lujan's made no bones about tying himself to the progressive agenda, and yet here you have two local folks that are in a much closer battle than the race seems to be for the president. Look, I think that at the end of the day, um, you know, we know the way the state breaks down, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, obviously Albuquerque, Santa Fe is a very progressive liberal leaning part of the state. Uh, Not, there's not enough votes outside of Albuquerque. But but Uh, let me ask you a question. You know, uh, Trump's at 39, Ron Ketty's at 40%. They're not that different. Is is uh, this a, they're not that different, but look at where, look at where Biden is and where, uh, Luhan is. Uh, I mean, there's not that many points separating them, and I think that you're going to find out. It's a that, five point spread there. Yeah, I, I, I think that's that's. I mean, the margin of error is usually three. So okay. to find that we're even within, you know, the striking distance of the margin of error in a state that Democrats hugely outweigh Republicans in voter registration, I gotcha. think is a good shot for Republicans. Now the problem is, is what can Republicans do to capitalize on it? Right? You mm-hmm. have the legislature. You know, New Mexico is a unique state, right? In big states. California, New York, you really look for your your coattails from the top down, right? Right. You look for your governor, U.S. senator, candidate, president. In New Mexico, that outside of when the governor runs, it really seems to be a bottom-up approach, right? I mean, you either have to have really strong legislative races that are going to get people out to vote, which right. then filter up the ballot, then mm-hmm. you do going down the ballot. And so, um, you know, we know the House and the Senate are both making a push on both sides, uh, to capture the House and the Senate, you know, the, the Republicans think they have a chance to pick up two or three seats in the legislature down south. Um, you have a hotly contested CD2 seat. So uh, my answer on the on the on the Biden Trump deal, I don't think Trump is as bad off as people think when you start okay. in his stance on oil and gas. I don't think there's anything President Trump can do to win over independents and liberals of Albuquerque, Santa Fe area. There you go. Didi, let me ask you this. Um, the Hispanic vote, Gary Johnson did quite well, as we all remember in 2016. Uh, but it, interesting, Mr. Biden is doing well with Hispanics, certainly. But is there something we need to be aware of with the Hispanic vote when it comes to Joe Biden? Well, um, Joe Biden is, is leading Trump in this category by two to one. Mm-hmm. Um, that's, that's pretty heavy, heavy, heavy odds there. Um, and, um, I think, you know, on these polls, particularly the, uh, the one of Biden and Trump versus the congressional polls, you mm-hmm. really have to look at the nature of the poll itself. The size of the sample for the presidential, uh, poll was larger than it was for the congressional polls. Uh, that makes a difference. Um, and um, one of the things that um, really, uh, two, two things actually that really are different this time in the poll is the small number of undecideds. Mm-hmm. Um, things are pretty fixed in place already. I believe there's a seven, seven percent undecided in that presidential race. Right. That's much smaller than the usual, which is usually about 13 to 15. 
Um, and in other races, it is equally true. Uh, the other thing that I found different about this poll was that instead of the Republican, Independent, and um, uh, Democratic categories, which Sandroff usually uses, this time uh, it's moderate, liberal, and conservative. This yes. is new. Yes. This is new. And um, I was interested in the fact that he did that this time, um, which may sort of um, uh, indicate a shift in, in the party, uh, party loyalties. There are some things about it that are very fixed. Like, you know, we saw that more Hispanics uh, favored the Democrats, more, um, uh, more people in the Northwest part of the state favor the Republicans. The East side is solidly Republican mm -hmm. and the Rio Grande corridor is Democrat. Right. Uh, but this, this whole thing, um, about uh, moderates, liberals, and conservatives uh, may be um, a shift in how we're looking at uh, the voting populace. And, mm -hmm. and keep in mind that these are likely voters right. that were polled. In other yep. words, they voted in either the uh, 2016 or the 2018 uh, elections or both. This does not um, it does not poll frequent voters who vote in primaries, uh, and it does not poll newly registered or new new voters. That so, that bit right there that's interesting to me. The new voters not being polled, mm -hmm. and you got to wonder, Kathy Miguel. Sorry, Didi, to kind of cut you there. I, I just running a little short on time. Uh, Kathy, talk about that. You know, the influence of young voters, new voters, all that, and, and what it means for these numbers. Are they going to change anything here? What's, what's your guess? You know, I think that there are a lot of new voter initiatives. Mm -hmm. um, and I just saw something recently that a Rio Rancho team from a high school is soliciting um, students from all across the state. Uh, to who are going to be 18 at the time of the election or talking to uh, voters who may not be 18 at the time of this election, but looking towards future elections when they will be 18. So I think young people are getting motivated to get out there and vote. And that's really encouraging to me. And I think that they can make a big shift in what happens um, from um, my vantage and what I'm hearing from young people is that, you know, they are not happy with with this binary system. Uh, they don't like the candidates. Um, but I do like hearing that they are still going to participate in the process. And that's what we're encouraging young first time voters to do is to get out there and learn about the process and especially learn about what's happening in your local governments. You know, what's happening uh, with those initiatives that are going to affect you immediately and, and you're going to see the people uh, every day that, that you're voting for, that you're going to see them more often. Mm -hmm. So I do think that young voters are going to have uh, a, a significant role to play and that we need to be uh, focusing on getting them out to vote. Voter registration day, September 22nd, is something that mm -hmm. uh, these young people are saying, you know, we're going to get our first time voters out there to get involved in, in, in this electoral process. So I'm, I'm excited about it. Kathy, real quick, I'll stay with you on this. We just got a couple of minutes left in this segment. What do you make of the CD2 race being uh, too close to call in quotes? Uh, Sochil Torres is doing a lot of TV. Yvette Harrell is doing her thing. It, it's too close. Are you surprised by that? I am not surprised by it. I think, you know, one of the things that, that we don't talk about is that there is a big race issue here is that, you know, who are, uh, you know, Republicans likely to vote for. Uh, it, it looks like it's sort of split along racial lines that Hispanics are more likely to vote for Torres Small and and uh, white voters are more likely to vote for um, Yvette Harrell. So I think that, mm -hmm. you know, it has been um, pretty predictable that it was going to be really close. Didi, would you agree with that? Predictable? I mean, yes. Social Torres won by two points last time around. Yes, I think so. it's very predictable. This mm -hmm. has been a Republican seat. Um, uh, Sochi won uh, only by two points, as you say. A little bit, a little bit less, actually, now that I think about mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that I find very funny about that race is I've been following the ads for, 
for uh, both of these women. And it's interesting that, you know, all the congressional candidates are women, right. um, which is which is a first. Um, but the some of the themes um, that are being used um, in that race are also being used by Ron Ketty uh, in his race. He will work with anyone. Uh, so will Yvette uh, Torres. Uh, I mean, so will uh, Sochi Small. Mm -hmm. And then they're being criticized. She's being criticized for that. Um, but he's using the same, same theme. And I think it's appealing to the middle. Mm -hmm. Dan, real quick, let me ask you, you touched on Ron Ketty there a little bit and you're, you're open. But more specifically, what does he have to do to close the gap here? I mean, is it the debate issue? I mean, Ben Ray has agreed to two debates only. How does he get around this being a challenger? <clears throat> Yeah, he, so he's got to, I mean, first thing he's got to do, what every challenger has to do is raise a ton of money. I mm -hmm. mean, that's, that's step number one. I mean, there's no lack of money. Ben Ray has proven that he can raise money being, uh, you know, he was charged of raising money under Nancy Pelosi in the House and did a phenomenal job when they took back the, the House. What he's got to do is, is if you are not, if you don't have the money, he's got to figure out a way to get earned media and he's got to figure out a way to get Ben Ray to, you know, produce Ben Ray as something other than, you know, a, a legacy politician. You know, he's mm -hmm. got to find a way to chink the armor that that Ben Ray is. You know, and you saw that, right? There was an ad that came out early about, you know, prior to going to Congress that that uh, Congressman Lujan was a blackjack dealer. Mm -hmm. um, so so you he's really got to draw a distinction. I think it's going to be interesting um, it's, it's going to be a neat roll of the dice to see if Ben Ray is correct in avoiding the debates uh, more than the two debates with um, with Mark Ronchetti. The question is, what can Mark Ronchetti do about it? Everything in politics is irrelevant unless you have the money to get out and tell the people why it's relevant. And True. unless Ronchetti can get that money poured in here to help him, you know, hammer Ben Ray, it's it, it, it may wind up making the race a little closer. Mm -hmm. But if people don't start pointing up the cash and letting him get a consistent drumbeat message out there, it, it, it's hopeless. Good call there. Right of time on that one. Our land is next. We're back after that to debate debates. <laughs> 